Um, so we're going to talk about 3D printing, and, and actually it's unfair to talk about 3D printing without talking about the prior art to do with 3D printing, um, which is, of course, clearly the Clangers had prior art on 3D printing. Um, any of you were old enough to remember this episode, you remember a lovely machine that they had where they could dial any shape here and something plastic came outside. So that, uh, that 3D systems patent looks a bit dodgy in my opinion and, uh, and hopefully Oliver Postgate would have got a reward for it. But actually I would love to tell you that this is where my story to do with 3D printing and everything like that started, you know, when I was a small child watching the clangers. But it wasn't. Uh, it was in equally strange circumstances when I was uh, high on chicken pox medicine watching the Olympics opening ceremony. And I saw the Industrial Revolution with uh, Branner doing his best Brunel, and then the Digital Revolution with Tim Berners-Lee and Next Cube. And I realised that there was probably a coming together of these things, and that would be a bit exciting. I also felt very old when I saw this because I built my first website sort of about six months after they released the code, and I suddenly realised I'd been building websites for 20 years, and I thought, ooh, I'd quite like a change now. Um, don't really want to do that for the next 20 years. Um, the irony of that will become obvious to you fairly soon. So, we decided, as a way of thinking about this, to go and laser scan something. We were really interested in what this data looked like and felt like, and, and the thing that we decided to laser scan, obviously, was a vintage Victorian steam engine. Uh, this is Winifred, she worked in the quarries uh, up in Wales. She then was bought by an American antiquities dealer, sold to the guy who ran the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, and stayed in dry storage in the States for 40 odd years, and then came back to Wales. So we thought, there's a really interesting time capsule there in that engine, and actually because it's going to be restored, we'd like to make a digital time capsule of it. So we scanned it, we photographed it from every angle with really, really high resolution cameras, and we could make a really accurate 3D model of it, which we then, for fun, printed out some parts, one-to-one -one scale, which then got all the IP lawyers really, really excited, because they said, so this is effectively a replacement part for a Victorian steam engine in stainless steel, and we went, yep, and they said, what does that mean for the future of IP, and we went, you're the lawyers, go figure, um, and we're still having interesting conversations with them about that sort of thing, but we actually think, you know, the whole... Well, basically, the physical world needs to learn from the music industry and start selling the shapes to its things before piracy happens. I think that's the answer. We then also printed out a smaller version of it because we wanted to know how it felt to hold it. And, um, and then, because in the dim and distant past, I was the CTO who built Moshi Monsters, um, weird things happened to me, like Wired stalks me. And before I knew it, there was a Wired piece, and Radio 4 had invited me on, um, and then we got invited to World Maker Fair in New York, because uh, they said, we love what you're doing. And we said, what are we doing? We're just laser scanning strange trains. We're not quite sure yet. Um, but something emerged at Maker Faire that was really interesting, which was that kids, boys and girls, came along and tried to put the parts together to try and assemble small models of steam trains. And uh, we thought that was exciting, especially since there was a 3D printed jewellery store right next to us, a beautiful jewellery, and the girls weren't interested. They were really interested in the obscure Welsh steam trains, which was great. Um, and we realised that we could talk to them about what we'd done and about how amazing it was that this object had run for 80 years and how make, do and mend culture was amazing. And we thought there was something interesting in that. And we came away from it having talked to Dr Sue Black, who was out in, in New York at the time, and decided that we were going to look at how we could use 3D printing for education. And we arrived back, and in the office was our lovely MakerBot Replicator 2. We thought, this is brilliant, we're off, we're sorted. And then we printed a whole load of absolute rubbish. None of it worked. It all fell apart. It was very disappointing. And we realised that actually um, 3D printing is easy and hard at the same time, um, which is an interesting thing because, first graph of the day, um, 3D printing is, is about to cross the chasm from the geeks to the normals, which is kind of exciting. Not quite sure when, but it's, it's coming. We see lots of interest in it. We go to parents' evenings at schools and parents start saying, how much is that? I'd quite like one for home. And so we think that actually 3D printing, according to Gartner, is somewhere here in the miserable bit. Um, but actually that's good because it means that we'll have some fun products for when it gets into the nice bit of the craft. But for us to do that, we need to understand the difference between 
us in the room, geeks, I'm assuming most of you are, because you're here at this, and the normal people. So what's the difference? <coughs> well, actually, geeks are creators, and they really don't like buying content, and they think it's really odd that anyone would buy content, and they love to tinker, and they like things that aren't quite finished, because it gives them a challenge. Mass market people, totally, totally different. So they hate a challenge, they'll moan to their friends if it's not quite there. They're consumers rather than creators. They get scared about creative stuff. There's an enormous number of them. There's a huge number more of them than there are of us. And no matter what we think, we're never going to change that. We're never going to educate a whole load of adults to become geeks. Uh, we might get their children, which is the interesting bit. But they will buy content. So, time for a trip down memory lane. which used to sound really great. Somebody didn't turn the sound on. <laughs> that's, no, I think we're muted still. No, because that's the same no? speaking. OK, splendid. So we'll just sing along. <laughs> so we know that that was normal television back when we were young. We remember it, the cheekiness. wasn't for you. Oh. I knew I was in trouble here. Um, but actually, that day is long gone. And if you talk to those lovely people, the venture capitalists, they'll tell you that actually this is the new television. YouTube's the new television. People going online and watching all sorts of stuff on YouTube, and that's, that's the new thing. Um, they're so, so wrong. New television for normals is Netflix. Not only is it more revenue, but it's more profit because they don't have to store all the silly videos of cats that nobody ever watches. And so actually they make a lot more money. And normal people will happily pay for Netflix rather than go scouring through YouTube for content. Ask any of your friends who is normal. They'll tell you that's true. And so this is TV for normals. And you can tell it is because actually remote controls now even have their own button for it. So between two versions of this remote control, that button there, which was all about information, has turned into a Netflix button. So Sony's not really playing around when it's doing that sort of thing. And everyone says to me, well, Netflix is a platform or it's an app or things like that. And actually, I think it's more exciting than that. I think it's a publisher. Publishers are cool. They curate stuff. Normal people like publishers. They like record labels. They like magazines. They like books. They might not come in the same format they used to buy them in, but they still buy them. And so we think that actually the way you jump the chasm is in content. And it's happened before. So you needed hit CDs for CD players to take off. They didn't really take off until there were lots of CDs that you might want. Or more importantly, CDs that you know, you'd already owned on tape and you heard at a friend's house and you thought, well, that sounds better. And actually, the iPod, which everyone sees as this big runaway success, wasn't until we had the iTunes store. Because actually, normal people don't rip their CDs. It just doesn't happen. And everyone talks about computers as this great creativity thing. We all learned to code, and wasn't it marvellous? They took off because of games. That's why they took off. People playing Manic Miner, going to school, telling their mates, their mates pestering their parents for a spectrum, and the cycle goes on and on and on. So, content's really important. But will any old content do? And the answer is no. So Airfix is a really interesting one. Airfix's first kit, everyone thinks, was a Spitfire. But it wasn't. It was a tractor. It didn't do very well in Woolworths. Um, actually, as soon as they did a Spitfire, a Spitfire's the greatest hit. Everyone wanted one. It was just after the war. Everyone loved the Spitfire. And they immediately followed up with the Hurricane. They sold tons. And if you talk to them now, the first thing they launch in any line is a Spitfire, even nowadays. Lots of games consoles launch with people like Sonic, because it's comfortable. You kind of know what it is. And actually, if you look at stuff like um, Toys to Life and, and these sort of games like Skylanders, that if you've got children, you find are very expensive. Actually, when they launched, they went back to a character from a previous generation, Spyro, because they know there's something comfortable about it. Even the scary, moody head of Phil Collins was important. <laughs> So In the Air Tonight was one of the biggest video hits on MTV when it started. And then we mentioned these guys before. And then look at the iTunes store. Actually, when they came to launch the iTunes store, they switched the music that they had in the background. So it was always edgy things you hadn't heard before. 
as soon as the iTunes store came out, roll out U2, and off we go. And there's a reason for this, which is that greatest hits act as a comfort blanket for normal people. When they are faced with a new transaction or a new medium or a new device or whatever, actually what they really love is greatest hits. And we think that's kind of important because actually we think 3D printing is not just an interesting manufacturing thing, we actually think it's an entertainment medium as well. We're really interested about what people will make playfully at home, what kids will make playfully, what will fit in with people's hobbies. That's far more interesting than manufacturing. And if you look at some of the early licenses that have signed up to create 3D printable content, they're really, really great. So it's people like Sesame Street, Martha Stewart Living, and Hasbro. And those are all available to download, purchasable as well. And we hope we're going to be there too. So who's we? Um, some of you in the audience may know Dean Vipond here. Um, others of you may know James Richard, Mark Simpkins. Uh, the other one's my wife. She's a bit of a backroom person. She doesn't like me saying that, but she's actually very, very good at marketing. Venture capitalists, lovely people. They always congratulate me on hiring my wife when I married her because she'd worked in marketing for a publishing company at Oxford University Press. I do so love venture capitalists. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to reinvent an effect with 3D printing. And the effect we're trying to reinvent is not the grey and the brown and the green from the 1980s, and it really was that colour palette. It hasn't faded. Um, we're trying to reinvent the effect on devices like the ZX81 and the Spectrum and Manic Miner to do with 3D printing. We're trying to make playful things that we hope will be like those games. that will be an easy, comfortable first thing for people to do. So, an important thing about this is parents and teachers. Parents and teachers are normals. They'll meet their first 3D printer. They'll get scared about it. They won't know what to do with it. Same thing happened before with the Spectrum. You ask anyone whose parent bought a Spectrum, and you said, what did your parents do? And they went, they opened the box. And maybe they put some of the cables together, but they didn't really do much with it. If they're a normal person, they didn't. What they did was they went to WH Smith, and they bought a book. And they maybe bought a magazine as well. And you sat and you typed in code and things like that. And they still do. So this was the, um, one of the biggest selling books the last two years. Sold huge numbers of copies. Um, publishing industry absolutely loved it. And uh, the people who bought it were parents, parents and grandparents. They wanted to understand what the kids were doing. They wanted to help them. They didn't understand that actually Stampy and all of those people whose videos they thought were inane drivel were actually the tutorials that the kids needed. So they bought a book, and then they went and read the book, and then they understood it a bit more. And this again comes back to where the tech industry doesn't quite understand normals, and I mean the, the London, Silicon Valley, cult-esque tech industry. Because you go and talk to a venture capitalist or somebody who's a, a techie, and they'll go, magazines? Does the publishing industry exist still? And everyone doing it on tablets. And we've actually invented a new challenge that we're going to uh, try out, which is we'll lend a venture capitalist a small child and take them to a WH Smith's and tell them they have to escape without buying a magazine or the child crying, because we think they're all going to fail miserably, because we all do. And so we're really interested in this. We're talking to magazine publishers, and we're also talking to book publishers, because we want to make products that normal people understand. So that's the sort of scene setting bit. So now we get on to what we're actually doing. Our product development uh, started last year when we hired uh, this chap. Uh, this is my son, Tom. He's our head of product testing. He's very, very useful. He has no empathy or diplomacy. So if things aren't right, he tends to throw them back at you across the table, which is really good. So he and I sat in the office trying to make Lego bricks because we were really interested in tolerances on 3D printers and how well we could get them to work. Well, I was interested in that. He was interested in the biscuits more than the 3D printer. And eventually, when we could get them to clutch properly to Lego, he was really happy and just went, oh, it's slightly stripy Lego, which is the point at which we knew all about the tolerances of three or four different 3D printers and how they changed and how they changed with different bits of filament and stuff like that. And we then thought, that's interesting. We now know how to create assemblies of things because up until now, 3D printing has been more about trinkets than assemblies of things. There are only so many beautiful 3D printed vases you can ever own in your life. And we started then thinking, well, that's interesting, but where do we get the greatest hits of the world? And the answer, of course, is in museums. That's where they reside. So I think it's fair to say that the, the modern age gallery in the Science Museum 
is kind of a mini greatest hits of the world. It's sort of now that's what I call the 20th century, if you like. So we started looking at how we worked with museums because we thought that would be a really good first step in our three-stage plan to world domination stroke getting 3D prints into schools. And we went to a, 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 a thing called Museums and Heritage and we met these two lovely people. This is Natalie and Fahana and they're the education team at Tower Bridge. And they said to us, would we develop a STEM education plan for them? And we said, we'd love to. And we said, you'll have to use a 3D printer. And they said, oh, OK, we've never seen one before. So this is actually the first time they'd seen one in operation. So it was a great leap of faith from them. And to sort of help them through this process, we made loads and loads of prototypes of all different stages. And we sort of sat down, we showed them to them because we wanted them not to ever be surprised about what they might have to teach the kids with, because they're normal. So you're asking them to go out of their comfort zone by teaching kids about STEM and coding and electronics and 3D printing. And we then had the most amazing experience, which is we got to play with the original plans for Tower Bridge. We got to see them, and we got to photograph them. Um, we even got to touch a couple of them. Um, we also discovered uh, the greatest Bond villain that's never been, the infamous Bascule Chamber, which we think would be really, really good. And the Bascule Chamber is the bit that the bridge drops down into. And then we got to go down there, which was the most amazing privilege. And we filmed loads of it, because actually no kid's ever going to be allowed to go down the really steep steps we had to, even though that door was where Victorian children had to go to clean and to make the workings work again. So we went into the chamber and we decided so that we could tell stories about that door to children that we'd put it into the 3D printed model that we were building. And we got to film through all sorts of amazing access panels. We actually had to create a special camera rig to film from one angle. It was either that or be uh, two feet away from the bridge when it was opening, uh, which none of us really liked the idea of. And we took some quite amazing footage, such as this one that kids really, really love. Obviously, that's a bit speeded up, but lessons are kind of short. And so we then started working on how we made a 3D printable tower bridge that they could play with. We did loads of this in the open. This was the first time that it opened. This is the Oxford launch pad um, inside business school. Uh, obviously, it's speeded up a bit. People don't really move that fast in there. They're busy, but not quite that busy. Um, we had to get it working that day because the following day, uh, Matt Hancock, who's the Minister for Skills, was coming. And we thought it was a really good opportunity for us to bend his ear about uh, what should happen. Um, and then we, uh, then we took it to Nata Fahana. And there's nothing lovelier than seeing glee in the face of clients. Um, it makes you feel like you've done a good job. And this is the classroom that this gets taught in. It's actually inside the bridge, which is quite an amazing venue. And the kids go in, they assemble pre-3D printed models of Tower Bridge. There's a 3D printer in the corner that whirs away. And what it whirs away doing is making cogs. So these are the magic cogs that lift the bridge. These are the exciting bit. This humble little thing lifts that massive bridge. And all the kids get to take one home. And the reason why they do is that we want them to tell the story of what they've seen to their classmates, to their parents, to their friends, to their teachers. And what we'd love to do is have loads of these experiences at different museums around the world, and eventually you build up a little tiny library, a little tiny museum of things that you've got from these places. But the important thing is the questions that they ask you after they've seen the 3D printer working. It shows they've understood totally what this thing does, and more importantly, what it will do for them. So they ask, how many layers are there? What's the plastic? Could you do it in this? Could you do it in that? Can you do more than one material? We actually had a really interesting discussion with one uh, small boy who was 10, about uh, polyjet multi-material jetting, which we thought was quite an advanced topic to be discussing with a 10-year-old. But actually, he really, really got it, which we were quite pleased. Because um, it sounds boggling most of the time when you hear it in conferences. And in the first six months of these sessions in Tower Bridge, uh, we taught over 2,000 children. Actually, we did a train-the-trainer thing, so the education team taught them. From over 60 schools, it's now booked fully for this term. They've had to take on a new member of staff which is really, really exciting for them. And the thing that we did was we then went and looked at all of the bits that we'd made and looked at where they need sticky tape. We looked at where bits had broken. 
And we then started re-engineering it so that actually we could make ones that would stand up to the test of time. And what this taught us was about how to make things that weren't wobbly and how the kids would really love it and how you made fixtures and fittings that, uh, that would power classrooms for years at a time. So these are being used four days a week. So they've got to be robust. And, uh, and kids as young as 10 can put them together, can do, actually nine I think was the younger set, put the electronics in, do the coding and make the bridge lift, which is pretty exciting. So museums are the first step into it. And why are museums so exciting? The answer is because of footfall. So the British Museum, who we're talking to at the moment, has 270,000 children go through it every year. So actually we can get a whole load of those kids exposed to 3D printing really, really quick if we can get enough of the really big museums involved. The next step of the pathway, um, and it's exciting about talking this about today because we've launched something today, is about schools. So for schools, we're going to do subscriptions to schools. And actually, again, we're thinking very much around what are teachers? How do they feel about these things? They're normal people. How are they feeling? What do they need to make these machines work in the classroom? And the answer is they need content. So we went to the BET show in London, which uh, for those of you who haven't been is a, a wonderful but hellish environment where uh, several hundred thousand people come through over the space of four days. And we took a little tiny printed guide to what we thought 3D printing was and we sat down with a whole load of teachers, took lots of biscuits, had some chairs, which are really, really good at trade shows. And, um, and we just didn't really stop for four days. This was one day at BET. You can see Tower Bridge flapping up and down there. People loved it because actually we had things that moved and things that flashed, and they were used to digital whiteboards, which are boring kids, senseless in classrooms at the moment. Lo lots, of te yeah, lots of teachers are really finding it hard to motivate kids, especially because about one third of children are actually kinesthetic learners. They learn by touch, and digital classrooms don't really help them. Although a futurist I once met from, from Pearson said, that's okay, we can give them haptic gloves. Brilliant, great idea. All the real world, one or the other, I don't mind. Um, and we went back from there and we spent a lot of time in our rather cluttered space thinking about what we could do for teachers. And the answer was to create a whole load of things they could print out. And not just 3D print, but actually print in paper. So, this is where again we have discussions with the venture capitalists who don't understand it. And they say, where's the iPad app? And we'll say, actually, you're lucky if you get a laptop that works in schools. Um, so we've got instructions, lesson plans, and visual aids, ones that can be projected, ones that can be printed out. We've got activity sheets. We've got uh, things in this kit where you make paper planes. We've got other ones where you design butterfly wings. So it's all very, very low tech. But the high tech bit is the 3D printable content. And it's things that you wouldn't normally be able to get hold of in a classroom. So for example, uh, fossils. So you can do lots of lovely 3D printed fossils. The kids can hold them. If one of them nicks it, it's not a problem. They cost about 40p to print. Um, but we also do them in these 3D printed rocks so you can actually do fossil hunts in schools. So you can put them together, you can go and bury the rocks, they can do a grid, and they can do a proper fossil hunt. So we're trying to make education playful. And the things that we're disrupting in that lovely uh, digital term from the valley are people who sell lesson plans because actually they only sell the lesson plans and the teachers then have to go and source the physical props to go with it, which they don't have time for and so actually the lessons aren't quite so effective. And people who sell physical props, but they don't come with lesson plans because they can't be bothered to make the lesson plan and then the teacher has this thing that stands in the corner of the room, doesn't really do much. And actually is normally so costly to purchase they never let the kids touch them in case a bit of it goes. Uh, so actually we sit in the middle with both of them and you can print replacement parts anytime you like. So if uh, a small child runs away with the lungs of the human body, then that's okay, you can print another pair of lungs. But more importantly, we want to uh, disrupt the, the pure tedium of most of the lesson plan providers. They really haven't thought about primary schools being places where you can learn through play. And so we had a lot of, um, a lot of teachers talk to us at bed and say, um, could you do a 3D printed volcano that the kids can touch? And we said, yeah, we can do that. We can easily do that. We can go and get some geodata. And they went, can you do something else with it to make it more exciting? And so we had a bit of a think. So we cut a thread in Mount Hood. And you can now screw it onto any Coca-Cola bottle. <laughs> this is the first time we ran it. <laughs> and there you go. You get a lovely, lovely, lovely eruption. Um, 
it gets more fun if you do it with kids. There's going to be no sound here, is there? So there's lots of screaming in that video, which you'd hear if the sound was on. There's also the sound of my father, who's in the background, who is a science teacher, going, stand back now. Because, um, you know, as a science teacher, you have to make sure everyone's away from the uh, experiment when you go. And it was actually when we did this that we realised who our enemy was. And it was dull lesson plans, and it was wrong lesson plans. And the, the worst example of this uh, comes from this book. Um, people actually do a lesson which is about making Stonehenge with biscuits. Because biscuits are cheap. And, um, and they go, oh, the children have learnt how to make Stonehenge with biscuits. And it falls down. It's just like the real Stonehenge. What they haven't realised is the real Stonehenge stood for about four and a half thousand years. And so actually it was a brilliant piece of engineering. And you wouldn't know that because actually Bourbon biscuits don't come with mortise and tenon joints in them like the real Stonehenge does. And so we think there's a better way to teach children about that sort of thing in the 21st century. So we're talking at the moment with uh, English Heritage about getting the LiDAR data. And we've done a few test prints. And we now know that we can make a Stonehenge that fits together the proper way. And it doesn't fall down because it's properly engineered. And, uh, and we can hopefully banish uh, biscuits to the biscuit tin rather than the classroom. And then um, we had some teachers say to us, we'd like to teach maths, and we'd like to teach engineering, we'd like to teach structures. But at the moment, we either do it with marshmallows and spaghetti or with straws and blue tack. We could do it with connects, but connects is really expensive and it always walks. Uh, we know this very well because actually we had to pat our five-year-old son down every day when he left school at EYU because he'd often have a creation he'd made with connects he was trying to smuggle out to show us. Um, so what we've done and what we launched today are these things called straw blocks. And they're 3D printed blocks that take ordinary drinking straws. These are the ones you can buy from Ikea, 200 uh, straws, 55p. Each of the blocks costs about 10p to print. We've open sourced the design so everyone can play with it. We've done lots and lots of play testing with small people. And you can make all sorts of mathematical shapes. You can make all sorts of engineering shapes where you can start cross bracing them, um, like this particular cube. Um, this is our older son making it. He's actually a really good tester. He probably won't mind me saying this, but actually his dexterity with his fingers isn't that great. His fine motor control isn't great. So he's been perfect for testing this sort of stuff. I made a bridge, because I like engineering. There it is without my ugly mug in the background. Um, we made an arched bridge, which is probably more the sort of bridges that we'd find around here. Uh, my wife, who uh, does all the marketing, made a little stick man, um, which you can obviously pose in any way and you can do for animation. You could enclose it in clay to, to do all sorts of things. And, um, and I had the great joy, so every now and then, um, I get joys of being a CEO. Most of the time I wish I was a CTO again, because actually, as CEO, I now have to deal with all sorts of unpleasant people. Um, but every now and then you get a real win, like putting a web page live that says, what can you make of them? A hat, a brooch, a pterodactyl, for anyone who likes airplane in the audience. Um, and then there's a slight problem with these connectors, uh, which was shown up by our head of content, who has very clearly created a fertility totem, and so, uh, <laughs> and so we might have to go a bit slower on the whole user-generated content site, because <laughs> someone's bound to do something worse than that at some point pretty soon. So that's how we do stuff for schools, and we're starting to think about what we do for the home. We think the home market is a long way further off. Um, this is a rather lovely new machine from 3D Systems. Uh, some people don't like it because it's actually got cartridges you slot into the side that have got the plastic in there. Um, we think that normal people aren't going to want to spool the plastic, and actually they'll love something that feels more like a normal printer. Um, that one kind of does, apart from it's so loud you can't hear the telly when it's running, which is a bit disappointing. Um, but we think that that market is going to take off, uh, partly because these guys just hired the retail chief of Bose speakers to be their retail chief. And you kind of don't do that unless you're serious. So we're starting to think about the home market. We hope it'll be a bit more like the education market and that we can teach kids a bit as we're doing stuff. So heading towards the end. So what's our mission as a company? 
Well, we think that by taking these things from museums and dropping them into schools and dropping them into homes, we can inspire a whole generation of kids. We want to be a 3D printing brand that kids love and that teachers come to us when they need help, because sure as hell they're going to, and that parents trust. And that if we can do that and make education more playful along the way, that'd be great. It's also really important, and this is one of Mark's lovely phrases. Um, so Mark has done all sorts of important things for the BBC in the past, like Democracy Now! And then he and I uh, worked together when he was project managing the Vogue UK iPad app. Not as much fun as you might think. Lots of very pouty, moody women to look at all day long. Um, they really did need to smile. Possibly someone should have given them a biscuit. Um, but Mark's comment is actually we're just a publisher. And all we do is we publish 3D files in the same way that a record label publishes MP3s or Amazon publishes EPUB. They're just digital content files, and it's easier to think of them that way. It also saves us a lot of money just thinking we're a publisher, because it means we don't go on crazy technology-driven wild goose chases. Um, the irony is both Mark and I, a few years ago, when we'd done the Vogue thing, said, we're never going to build another bloody CMS in our life. And actually, it turns out we're building another CMS at the moment. Um, in the long term, if we get it right and we can inspire these kids, we think that actually we can have a similar sort of effect that the Spectrum did. So the Spectrum created a whole generation of people who coded, and actually as a generation, we've changed things. We've changed publishing, we've changed media, we've changed communication, we've changed commerce. So actually, if kids can get playing with 3D printers, they can change extraordinary things. And that's the thing that gets us up every morning. The other thing that gets us up every morning is, is thinking, and why we destroy so many post-it notes doing it, is thinking about really important things about teachers. So I briefly mentioned my dad earlier. Um, so he was a science teacher, and then he went on to teach people how to be science teachers. Um, we're very lucky that he's on our advisory board. And he occasionally says some really, really important things about what it is to be a teacher which actually you wouldn't know unless you were one. And the first one's about courage. And it's the thing, actually, that the whole geek community doesn't understand. We see a new bit of tech, we go at it, and we go, oh, it doesn't matter if I fail. And actually, that's because we're not failing in front of 30 kids. And actually, that's what would happen to a teacher if the stuff they were doing in class wasn't right. And there's a very important diagram to do with teaching called the Jahari window. And basically, Everyone starts off as being an unconscious incompetent. You don't know what you don't know. Most teachers, whenever the government changes the curriculum, or whenever a new piece of technology drops into the, into the, the classroom, immediately go here, which is the most uncomfortable place in history. It's like, I know I don't know something. I know I'm not good at this. And yet, we, geeks, governments, all sorts of people, expect teachers to just be able to cope. And so what we're doing is, we hope, creating products that basically get them to hear really, really quickly so they feel comfortable. Because if they don't feel comfortable, then the pattern that we see in schools will keep going on. And that pattern is that the 3D printer stays in the cupboard and it never comes out and the kids never see it. And so it may well as not be there. And that's why we're doing things like this with little tiny interventions that teachers can print out and lesson plans that go with them that will help them along the way. We've also been doing some stuff with little bits about coding and about electronics and about how to do computational thinking by putting together their devices and then making things like Tower Bridge move with them that we think will help lots of primary school teachers feel more comfortable about teaching computational thinking because they're not coders um, and it's a bit unfair to think that they're teaching it straight away. The other thing that um, we think about a lot, and this is really, really important, is that there's nothing worse for a teacher than a brightboard kid in class. Because the teacher's job is to try and bring everyone up at the same level. And they've been trained for that, so they'll naturally go back to that. Whenever they see a class dynamic, whenever they see a group dynamic, they will be constantly trying to rescue the middle and the bottom into the class, because that's how they know they'll succeed. And actually, this is where there's another important graph that comes in, which is that actually, Children go all the way up through this level. They go all the way from recall, translation, interpretation. So if we never show them the device, they'll never even get to recall. 
And yet, we get into arguments with the maker movement saying, well, you're giving them pre-made files. When are the kids going to actually get involved and do CAD? And our response to them is, don't worry about that. They're doing Minecraft. They're already doing CAD. They're fine. They're doing it in their spare time. At some point, when the teachers have caught up, you can teach them CAD in the classroom. But actually, what you need to do is help the teachers to get them up this ladder to synthesis. Because the maker movement and code clubs and things like that, which are wonderful things, they start here. And not every kid can do that. And so it's lovely to come and talk here in the centre of a place where engineering really started in the UK. The Industrial Revolution happened around here. And I think if we can actually help lots and lots of teachers to take children up this tree to do with 3D printing, to do with product design, to do with electronics, to do with understanding how the world fits together, actually we can have another industrial revolution, one which changes the balance of trade, one where we don't have to import everything again, one where we make things locally. But for us to do that, we have to understand normal people and how uncomfortable they feel when they hit technology. Then we have to make products that help them do that. So thank you for listening. I'm really sorry I can't be for here for drinks tonight because I've got to get back to Oxford and the trains aren't terribly good. Um, so if you'd like to email me, you can either email hello at ICanMakeHQ.com or you can send me a message. I'm Chris at ICanMakeHQ.com. And thank you very much for listening.